Okay, hello everybody. Uh, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today uh, I'm going to do part three on our character study of the devil. And what, what I'm doing is just simply uh, using Bible Hub, uh, putting in the word devil and Satan, and uh, every place that those words are appear or occur in the scriptures we're looking at the verses and and uh, trying to learn something about the devil so uh, with me today I have brother Stephen and uh, brother Stephen would you go ahead and unmute your mic and just say hi to everybody and tell them about your channel okay yeah hi uh, my name is uh, Stephen, I'm uh, in a group on YouTube called CA2A. Uh, we focus on um, reading the Bible and doing some practical things with uh, learning new stuff. And uh, we'll, you'll be welcome to join us and, and come and see us and have a look at what we do. Be re we'd be very blessed by your presence. Okay, back to you, Luke. You can. Uh you can probably tell from uh, Brother Stephen's uh, speech there that, that his, I say he has an accent, but Brother Stephen probably thinks I'm the one that has the accent. But uh, he is from England. I guess you live somewhere near near London. Um, so I'm, I'm happy this technology gives us the opportunity of uh, coming together from all over the world and, and having fellowship and studying together. All right, with no further delay, let's go to these scriptures here. And, brother, uh, I'm just going to read each scripture, and then we'll start talking about just extemporaneously so well, we don't have any preparation here. Um, okay, uh, the first one, uh, this is Matthew 4.10. Uh, I talked about this uh, before uh, in the previous study. But I'd like to get your input on this anyway, brother. You probably have some different insights than I have. Uh, I'm going to look at it in KJV first here. Um, oops, I went too far. Matthew 4.10. Okay, 4.10 says, um, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Okay, uh, brother, uh, would you want to talk about that verse? Uh, and uh, who's uh, we know Jesus is speaking. What's this setting that? This is at the beginning of uh, of his ministry, I believe. Uh, so this is uh, right at the beginning, or just before the beginning of his of his ministry. Maybe this is when he was uh, in the desert. Temptation of Jesus uh, was was tempted several times as he was in the desert for forty days and forty nights, and uh, Satan challenged him. And try to tempt him to come to serve him. Um, so I think that's the setting we're talking about here, and this particular verse that we're referring to here. This is just as he begins his ministry work, because the very next line is actually uh, the start of his ministry work um, in in uh, in uh, in this particular Bible. So this must be the 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 part where Jesus is wandering through the desert. Uh, for the 40 days and 40 nights when Satan challenges him um, and I think this is what this is referring to when it talks here it's very interesting I think when it says in verse 10 it says if Jesus unto him get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship thy Lord thy God and only shalt thou serve that's an interesting choice of words that it indicates to me that Satan himself is being told by the Lord that he him himself has to serve the Lord and no one else. I don't know if you have any views on that, brother. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think that uh, 
you know, uh, Jesus does not have to uh, listen and follow and, and uh, do what Satan is telling him to do. Uh, he has a choice. Uh, and just as we have a choice when we are tempted, but what I what I want to get your take on is this idea of being tempted. Let me read this. Um, I said again. It says, uh, 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 "The devil saith." This is starting at verse uh, seven. Jesus said unto him, "It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God." Uh, and it's, let me see if we go earlier. This whole scene is is referred to the, the temptation of Jesus. This is inserted in there uh, in the scriptures. It's, it's the term the temptation of Jesus is not actually scripture, but it's a it's a title for the chapter. And, and people think that Jesus was tempted, but what does it mean if Jesus was tempted? Does, does it mean that he actually was considering seriously uh, listening to the to the devil and and doing what he said, or when he when it says he, he, Jesus was tempted, does it just mean that the the devil was was attempting to tempt him, but Jesus was never like on the fence? Wondering, maybe, maybe I'll listen to the devil. Maybe I won't. Because when I think of the word tempt, yeah, I, I'm thinking that okay, it, it's affecting me in a way where I'm considering doing something. I'm tempted to do it. But mm -hmm. do you think that Jesus was really tempted in that way, where he was actually considering possibly doing what the devil told him to do, or was was he tempted in a way where the devil was trying to? get him to do something, but Jesus never really considered actually doing it. How do you see that? Well, the uh, way I see this, brother, is, is like this. I mean, first of all, we've got to look at what where what's going on, on in this situation. Jesus, uh, it says in what, in verse 1, right at the beginning, then, then was Jesus led up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now we've got to remember the context in what this is happening that Jesus as who is the Lord our God Almighty come down from heaven as a man and taken off some of his majesty. Uh, so he, he wasn't sort of like God in the sense that he was God Almighty. He left some of his power and glory up in heaven. Um, and I believe that the that he wasn't actually tempted, he was never tempted, but it, the devil tried to tempt him to lead him away uh, from his calling. It said he, he had fast, and it goes on, it says, and when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proclaimed out of the word of the mouth of God. So I think that Jesus was never really tempted by, in the sense that we understand it, that he was never going to be succumb to the to the devil's temptation, but because the devil knew that he had cast off some of his majesty, it's only my take on this, that he knew that he'd come down from heaven and that he'd cast off some of his uh, glory and his power, he thought that he might succumb to this temptation, especially considering that he'd been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights with nothing to eat or drink, um, and he thought, well, this is my chance to try to lead the Son of God away from his chosen path. I don't know if you've ever looked at it like that. Well, I think we're in agreement, and I think I'm making a distinction that to me, it, I think this is an important distinction. Uh, we know that Jesus set aside something in terms of his, uh, his deity. He, he was God and he was man, but somehow he I forgot the, the terminology the scriptures use, but he willingly set aside some of his ability. Uh, and, and so he actually hungered, his body actually did hunger, as a human being would hunger for food. 
But I don't think he tempt, he was tempted in the way that we think that we get, we are tempted. When, if I was tempted, it means that wait a second, give me a minute to consider this. Uh, I might I might do that. I might not. Uh, that's that's uh, really I, where I feel tempted. Even though the devil was tempting him, Jesus, I don't think, ever responded in a way where he was actually saying, hey, give me a minute, Satan, let me think about this. I might want that food. Uh, because to me, uh, we know that Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. And I think that, uh, that we can take it a step further and say that he was never even tempted by the devil. The devil was tempting him, but he never responded in a way where he actually considered doing it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, brother. I mean, that's just totally the way I look at it. I mean, you know, he, he, you know, he probably was hungry and he probably was thirsty, like you said, at his body, but he never really fell into temptation in the way that we might or people might who are listening to this hangout get tempted by various different things, and it's easy to fall into temptation for us. But this is the Son of God that we're talking about. This is uh, God in, incarnate in a human form. He was never going to fall for the devil's tricks. Where we don't, we we sometimes we allow ourselves as human beings to get tempted, and various temptations come along and challenge us. And you're right, we do have to sometimes step back, and we 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 have to say to ourselves, why is why are we getting this? What what is happening? And we have to look at that, and we have to consider what is happening when temptation comes along. But I think with Jesus and, and this encounter in the wilderness, I think he actually knew that this was going to happen uh, before it actually took place. And he knew exactly what he was going to say and what he was going to do because he had that foreknowledge before he went out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to the next uh, Satan verse. Uh, uh, some of these I've done in the previous shows, uh, so I'm skipping over them. Uh, but I'm looking at Matthew 13:39 right now, so let me click on that, and um, I'm going to look at it. And I always like looking at everything in KJV first, and then if I need a little help, I'll look at other translations or the Greek. But most of the time, the KJV is is clear, even though it's at um, Old English. So 13:39. Uh, okay, this is part of a parable. Uh, the parable of the weeds explained. 1339 it says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Uh, okay, so you know, I'm going to read this in context. I, it's always uh, uh, good to read the verses before and after, and to at least get a little context. And then you might have to even read the whole chapter to get the full context. But right now, starting with verse 36, it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Uh, okay, so in other words, he'd already said the parable. And in this case, He's, they're asking for an explanation. And Jesus answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the terrors are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so brother, there's the context. Uh, we're focusing on verse 39, but in that, in that context, what is the setting that, that Jesus is describing there? 
Okay, let's just go back to this. This is the parable of the weeds, as we, as you quite rightly said. So I think this is a context with this. Is looks like to me that uh, the the people that were were there uh, had been sent away, and he, it looks to me like he was talking to his disciples in a group privately um, at this point, and they wanted to uh, ask him to perhaps uh, clarify. I think would be the right word what this parable was about and he answered them by this by what is written from verses 37 downwards so I think this is a case where this is another case where Jesus is explaining the para, one of his parables as I think he did with a, one of the other parables he, he explained to Nicodemus about the meaning of being born again um, so I think this is a, a case where he's simply telling uh, the disciples uh, basically, what he's saying here is he said that you know he said well this is what it means he's that those who sow good seeds in other words those who follow Christ and believe in Christ shall be known as the son of men or son of son of man um, and and will become into the inheritance that Jesus has promised and he's also clearly saying that the field what he refers to as the field is the whole world yeah. Um, and he talks that they're, they're going to be children of good seeds, uh, which will be the good seeds in the world, will be known as the children of God or the children of the kingdom. And But there will be some people in the world that are wicked, like the wicked one. Yeah, And he, he clarifies this by saying that the enemy that has sown them is the devil. So he clearly says that, you know, that the devil is going to attempt or coerce people so far away from God that they're going to become bad seeds or bad things and you know they belong to the devil so I think this is a one aspect it's only my opinion yeah um, and he, he talks a bit further on about what's going to happen to these bad seeds that they're going to be burnt in the fire yeah and that was going to be at the end of the world, which we all know is going to be what we call the Great Tribulation, just after the Great Tribulation, which I believe is described in Revelations, yeah, and um, and that's the end of the world and what's going to happen. Um, so I think this is Jesus explaining to his disciples privately the meaning of this parable and trying to put it into context of the ages yet to come, because when this was spoken, it was a long time. Uh, in the future, and Jesus was just telling them what was going to be happening, where it was going to happen. There's going to be two kinds of people. I think in Revelations it refers to them as sheep and goats. Um, but and this is this is just uh, Jesus, I believe, explaining this. Um, but he, he he says here this very interesting. I think this verse 41: The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that are offered, and them which do inquire. That's an interesting phrase. I just wonder what you make of that, brother. Yeah, I think your the term sheep and goats and and wheat and tares uh, are making the same point that uh, you're going to have these two groups of people, the saved and the lost. Uh, the children of God and, and the, the uh, children of the, the devil. Um, and he, of course he's talking about the end when when the judgment will come. Uh, but what I find really interesting about this parable is that uh, uh, the both of them are living together. And you, you said that, that the, uh, the field is the world. Jesus said the field is the world, but it's the world as a whole, but it's also the ch even the church. Uh, if, if you're watching right now, maybe you just got home from attending church, and I don't know what you believe. If you, have, if you put your faith completely in Jesus and not in your own ability to work your way to heaven, then I would call you a brother or sister in Christ. But... Uh, and within that church, on that pew, maybe sitting on each side of you, could be a tear, T-A-R-E. Because even in the church, we have wheat and tares. We have sheep and goats. We have wolves in sheep's clothing. So uh, Jesus is telling us that we're going to be living together, the saved and the lost, but there will come a time when we're going to be separated at the, the final... At, for the judgment. 
But what I want to ask you about is when it says the devil planted these seeds and messed up everything. Uh, how do you, how, do you, the dead devil cannot actually create a human being and as a lost person. So what does it mean when the devil planted these seeds? Um, because when he interprets it, uh, he says uh, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. That's right. Yeah. So the devil has sowed these bad seeds, and we know that these bad seeds end up growing into lost people who are not children of God, they are lost, they are condemned. Uh, so how did how is the day devil able to sow these uh, uh, these bad seeds? I think there's uh, two ways that he does this and I think this goes back to our previous point where he uses temptation as one of his tools to lead people further away from God. I mean I'll just use an example um, let's take money for an example. Um, money is the root of all evil, the Bible says, so the devil can use money to distract people from following the right thing to do uh, with that particular amount of money that they're given and doesn't, not, um, a lot of people see money as a gift from God and they see it as a, a more worldly thing. So I think you can use different types of temptation, not just money, there's all kinds of temptation. And the further he starts, because we know that Satan is a great deceiver. It tells us that in, in in the Garden of Eden, when he was in this tree as a snake, he deceived Eve. Yeah. So we know he uses this deception, and I think all people have a choice. We have free will, and and you know we have a choice. We can either accept what the Bible tells us and what Jesus tells us, and from the Bible. Or we can believe a lie. We can believe one or the other. We can't believe both. I think God and and Satan is really doing his business at the moment. I'm sure you would agree with me. And he's deceiving. And like you said, there are many, many people in this world, even in churches, that are, t uh, are, are unsaved. And sometimes there are people that are, as you've quite aptly put it, wolves in sheep's clothing. But he is leading people so far away from the truth that they can find it very difficult to get back and I think that's where our job comes in as lovers of Jesus and Christ is to uh, to to con communicate to them you know this this you know what what did what do you want to be in the end times do you want to be a goat where you're going to be put into a fiery fiery furnace forever or do you want to be a son of God and live forever you have to be given that, you know, you have to put that in a way that people can understand. And I think this is what, this is where the devil is so prevalent in today, especially in today's society. You know, you've only got to put a telly on, you can see these things. Um, well, he's hard uh, at work, sorry. I do, th I do think that you're correct, um, I'm taking this all the way back to the garden. Because the devil's been up doing exactly the same thing. Um, we can even go one step further back and, and at the fall of, of the angels when the devil decided that he wanted to ascend above the throne of God and he convinced somehow a third of the angels to go on his side and rebel against God. So he did it with the angels. He did it with Adam and Eve in the garden, tempting them. and He tempted them but with ego. Um, uh, making them think, well, you don't need to like be under God. You can be a God yourself if you'll just eat from the fr fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can be like God and know right from wrong. So this person, uh, Satan, the devil, he has been uh, causing trouble like this with the angels, with Adam and Eve, and even throughout history, even today. And we have seen him even trying to do this to Jesus in the 40 days in the wilderness. Uh, so he's been stirring up trouble all this time, trying to get people. But the main thing he wants people to do is, is believe in themselves instead of believing in God. That's, that's been the, the case all along. That's been oh, the theme. Yeah. Yeah. His thing with the angels was, you don't need God, we'll become our own gods. Eve, you, God didn't tell you the truth, you will surely die. God lied to you, 
uh, if you, the truth is, if you eat from the tree, you'll be like God. And, and all the religions of the, today are based upon a person performing enough that they have achieved a level that it makes them acceptable. And, and rather than saying, no, I need God, they think, I'm going to do this on my own. And uh, the, all the religions are based upon that. It's the system of personal merit. And so, uh, all right, uh, unless you want to add to that, we'll move on to the next double verse, Satan verse. Okay. Um. Okay, I'm trying to find ones that I haven't discussed yet. Let's see here. Okay, here's another example, another parable, but another example of, of Satan uh, trying to prevent people from, from uh, uh, being with God. But let's look at Mark 4.15. I'm clicking on that. Mark 4.15. I'm reading the KJV. And these are like they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh and immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Um, so this is the parable of the sower. And I love this parable, and it's kind of controversial because there's four different classifications of people. And there's a big uh, debate or disagreement as to uh, which of these four groups are saved? Are one or more? Uh, so let's read the parable of the sower here. And uh, then I'll get your take on this, brother. I'm going to Matthew, uh, to, uh, Matthew 13, 1 through 9 right now. It says, uh, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. Uh, and some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, but, uh, but because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the th thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now this is another parable where Jesus actually interprets the parable for us. But first let me just get your reaction to the parable as a whole, brother. Um, well, I didn't quite catch the reference, so um, what? could you give that to me again, please, brother? Yeah, that's the, par the parable of the sower. Uh, you can find it in two places, Matthew 13, 1 through 9, uh, and you can find it in, uh, my, my screen's jumping all over the place, uh, or in, uh, uh, it's in Mark 4, 1 through 9, or Luke 8, 4 through 15. But we're looking at... Uh, Just give it. Just give us a second, brother. I'm just trying to switch screens. Yeah. Yeah, me too. It's uh, for some reason. Okay, Mark 4:15 was the original one that we're looking no, at. I'm going to trying to go to Matthew because I think that's the one you read from, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> no, it it also appears. This is Mark. 
Oh, uh, right, okay. Verse 1. Mark 4, yeah. verse 1, but it also appears in Matthew and Luke. So this appear, okay. parable of, appears in three of the four gospel accounts. Right, Matthew, Mark 4, yeah? Yeah. Mark 4, verse 1 through 9 is the parable of the sower. Yeah, I've got it. So I've then, got it. And then later on, it says, in verse, starting with verse 13, Jesus explains and interprets this parable. Yeah. But what we're looking at is verse uh, uh, 13. Let me see. What was the original one we were looking at? Uh, My, Matthew, Mark 4. 4.15. 4, 4.15, yeah. Okay. yeah. 4.15 is, uh, and these are they by the wayside where the word was sown, but when they heard, have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, that's that's a fascinating point about what Satan's doing there. But, but while we're on the subject, let's discuss this whole parable, because to me, this is a fascinating parable, and I know that over the years, my interpretation of this has changed. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask you is, um, there's four groups of people. Yep. Uh, how many of the groups do you think are saved out of the four? Right. Uh, so let me have just a quick read of it so I know what, what, what I'm looking at. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, he's talking here about four different groups of people, as you quite rightly said, and he first he puts them into different categories. Um, that's the way I I look at it. You've got first of all those seeds that fall on. Um, he says that they, they, that um, when he, when we look at the beginning, he says um, just just a second, just trying to be. He talks about the seed. Um, He's talking. I believe the seed here is the word of God. I think that's first we have to understand this. So we're talking about people that uh, understand the word of God and, and know the word of God. So he's talking here about that, I believe. Um, and he talks about here about um, first of all the seed that is immediately taken away. So this this to me is someone that um, may have some understanding of the law but doesn't really know anything about Jesus because I haven't researched it or looked into it so the Satan will come along and just snatch them away very quickly and sometimes that can happen shortly after you first become saved um, and then he goes on to talk about those ones that are fall on stony ground now those are the people that heard the world immediately receive it with gladness and joy but they have no roots so I think this is a what I call a a pseudomon Christian who like someone who calls themselves a Christian but doesn't really believe in the Christian message that Jesus is the Lord our Savior and we should believe in him with all our hearts and love him this is a you know the person that may sit on church every Sunday and not you know go home and then do things that they shouldn't so I believe this is someone that doesn't you know who doesn't really so I don't I think those two groups are not saved in the sense um, and then going on, and he, um, he he then talks about this the seeds being thrown into into the weeds um, or the thorns, as it says here. Now again, this is uh, someone who gets uh, hears the message of the Lord and gets saved, but they get themselves all sort of tangled up and mixed up and confused. It's only the way I interpret it and sort of in in branch with all these weeds and they can't move left or right because they just don't seem and they just get so stuck in one position uh that they just they just can't get out of it and that that, that is a problem for them. So they need some help with that. But I believe the only people that are saved are the very bottom one. Uh, there's only one that I believe and if I'm wrong that's fair enough. Um, which it says that those that have uh, sown on good ground, these are the people that hear the word, respond positively to it, try to change their lives, try not to be de tempted or deceived by Satan, trust in the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, with all their heart, mind and body, and do what they think the Lord is telling them to do by taking things into prayer and to... Uh, 
into righteousness with him and to have communion with him uh, daily. I don't mean the wine and bread, but pray to him constantly, talking to him, treat him like he was a real person that he's there. I think this is the kind of person we're talking to. So I think the first, I think there's four groups here, but I think there's only one. If I'm if I'm interpreting this correctly, and I'm not saying I'm right, but I believe there's only one here, which I think is the last one that actually is the, the ones that God is referring to as truly saved, the ones that believe in Him. Because I think it says in John 3:16, "For whoever so believed, uh, God so loved the world that He gave His only one begotten Son, that whoever believed in Him shall have eternal life." So I think it sums it up in that as well, and it clearly is. I want. I think what Jesus is reiterating in a different way here. If you truly believe in Him, follow Him, read His Word, pray to Him, do all the things that you got to do with Him, then you are saved. And any of these others, you got problems. Okay, brother. Um, all right. Well, I'm. I'm not going to say that you're wrong. I'm just going to say that I disagree. Uh, the way you've interpreted that is the way that I interpreted it for many years, and I, and and it's a very popular interpretation that of the four groups, only the last group are truly saved uh, because they are bearing fruit, uh, they're multiplying. Um, but I, I I'm going to show you why I think that uh, instead of one group being saved, there's three groups of four who are saved and then uh, you can uh, maybe reconsider or maybe not agree at all but um, I'm going to go through the parable of the sower here as he originally said it uh, behold there went out a sower to sow and it came to pass as he sowed some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up um, so Jesus interprets this whole thing later on down at go to verse 13 and he, he, he explains the entire parable so let's see how what he says about that one thing uh, first of all Jesus is uh, expresses amazement that they they need this parable explained in verse 13 he says and he said unto them know ye not this parable and how then will ye know all parables in other words, if you don't get this parable, this is so simple and obvious, I don't think you're going to get any of the parables if you don't understand this one. In verse 14, he says, The sower soweth the word. So what you and I are doing right now is we're sowing. And uh, throughout our lives, brother, you and I have told a lot of the people um, on the Internet and face-to-face the word which the good news the gospel how to be saved how to receive the free gift of salvation that is the seed that is sowed the sower is the person that's that's tell that's um, witnessing or evangelizing or whatever you want to call it we are the sowers the the seed is the gospel and so and then he goes on to say in verse 15 and these are they by the wayside where the word, the gospel, is to, it told them? But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So Jesus is saying that uh, even though these people heard the gospel, immediately they uh, were, uh, they didn't really accept it. It never as we're going to see later with the, like these other groups, it never came to life. You know that when we're when we become Christians, we believe this good news and we come to life spiritually. We are quickened. We are regenerated. Our spirit is born again, born from above. But these people, that never happened. Uh, it's like the person that Jesus refers to over and over again. They have ears, but they don't hear. So all the people that hear the gospel, but just go poo poo, and you know, and you know, instantly they just dismiss it. That's who they're. These people are not saved because they were never regenerated, never born again. Now let's look at verse 16. These are likewise 
which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterwards, when the affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So it's very easy to think that this second group here are not saved either because it says they have no root. And we know that Jesus is often called the root. Uh, so I've struggled with this second point, whether they're saved or not. But if we go back to the original um, parable, let's look at that. And he says, uh, the second group, verse 5, he says, And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. So it sprang up. To me, that's saying that it, 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 the, the seed was brought to life. And that's what happens when a person gets saved. They, they get brought to life. They get spiritually brought to life. But because it had no depth of earth, it immediately it sprang up, but it had no depth of earth. So the sun, when the sun was up and it was scorched, it, and because it had no root, it withered away. So this is the kind of person that gets born again. They're spiritually brought to life. But as Jesus explains later in the, in he, when he explains the, the parable, he says they have no root in themselves and so endure. But for a time after, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. Uh, now, it doesn't say that they uh, even lost their faith. It's just that that's the kind of person I have always referred to as the closet Christian. The kind of person that, uh, yeah, they, they believe, but they never get reach the point where they fall in love with the scriptures. They can't wait to meet with other Christians and talk about Jesus. And they, they never grow uh, spiritually and start maturing. They remain just a baby. And, and they don't even tell all their friends they believe. And they stay in the closet. And But, but sometimes if, 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 as soon as they, someone discovers that they, oh, you're, you say you're a Christian, well, don't you think that's stupid? What about evolution? You don't believe that story in the Bible, do you? So they're offended. But they're still a Christian. It's just that they never grew and matured. Now, I'm going to look at the third group here and tell you why I think they're saved. The third group is, um, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Um, well, uh, Jesus explains that one. Um, it says, and these are they which are sown among thorns. Uh, this is kind of like the wheat and the tares. We live among these, these tares, and these uh, people who are, are lost in the world, or the world uh, and uh, everything we have to deal with. It says here in verse 19, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now, Jesus is not saying that they never were brought to life. Apparently, they are brought to life because they're growing right among the thorns. They're growing. So they're obviously alive. The seed was brought to life. But it's, a, it's again, it's an, a person that never matures much spiritually, and it doesn't take that much to get them off track and start thinking about making money and thinking about lustful things and other things besides what we're doing right now thinking about Jesus and the Bible. So they're unfruitful. They're not producing any fruit. Uh, now let's look at verse 20. And, and I mean, let's, the last group, verse 8. And, and other fell on good ground, and it did, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Um, so when Jesus explains that in verse 20, uh, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word. So they hear the gospel, they receive it, and then they, they're not only born again, but they're bringing fruit. And some are bringing 30 times the fruit, some 60, some 100 times. I believe this fourth group is Brother Stephen. And... Brother Luke, 
and all of us who are um, not only we were brought to life spiritually but we've grown and matured because of our desire to learn about the scriptures to have fellowship with believers have these kinds of conversations you and I are having right now and try to work things out and figure out the scriptures we've grown and because we tell other people about it how many people in your lifetime brother have come to Jesus because of you and what you the fruit you you have produced is many converts mm. many people have come to salvation because of your uh, efforts spreading these seeds mm. so so my conclusion and again uh, I used to think that uh, your interpretation was correct and it's it's a popular it's a popular interpretation that only the fourth group are truly saved but I think that when people get saved we're all unique mm. and some people get saved and grow and mature a lot and produce mm. a lot of fruit some people get saved and don't produce as much fruit and some people get saved and the cares of the world and everything just interfere and they just never grow and produce much fruit yeah that's a very interesting brother Luke. I mean to be fair to you I mean I haven't quite looked at it like that so it's really interesting to get that that point of view and I can see what you are saying I would concur mostly with what you said uh, I, I, I haven't really because I, I believe like yourself that once you're saved that there's nothing we can do to lose our salvation I think we both agree on that um, and so obviously the you know these people regardless of whether they're stony ground in the, in the uh, thistles or forms or um, where they're, they're saved they're saved so they can't lose our salvation perhaps that wasn't a good choice of words for me um, but yes I can I, I think now you've explained it to me and I, um, I've never never quite heard it explained like that before it's opened up a whole new thing to me so I've learned something from reading from reading this with you and I really pray and hope that as we're having this conversation that we can sometimes uh, when we read bits of the Bible we sometimes can be a little bit fixed in our view but if we're open and we're able to have a discussion and talk about this that we can say yes what this person is saying makes sense I'm perhaps looking at this slightly though not the correct way and and maybe this is what the Lord is saying to us in in this in this parable you know there are several ways of looking at different pieces of scripture and sometimes it's good to have different ideas and then make your own opinion and then come to me and and pray about it you know and I will guide you you know and I, I, I'm not I do thank you because I've never quite looked at it like that because I've always had that that sort of view of that particular parable of the the um, the sower because perhaps it may be um, an evangelical thing from my past it's not sort of a passage I read very regularly um, and so therefore it's very interesting that when Jesus explains it it becomes quite obvious that he's talking about saved people and not unsaved people mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay, brother. Uh, to me, I've always loved the parable, and uh, it's, it's he. He said that <laughs> what I what kind of bothers me though is that he says that what do you why are you ask me to explain this parable to you if you can't understand this parable how are you going to understand understand the others because he seemed to think that this parable it should be really obvious to all of us what he's saying. All right, let's move on to uh, the next uh, devil verse see what we come up with uh, okay okay whoa uh, let's go to Luke 10 18 I don't know if I can even do this one uh, Luke 10 18 uh, it says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Um, well, if I reread this in, uh, in context here, um, this is the return of the 72 is the, is the subtitle of this section here. Starting with verse 17, it says, the 72 
returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Boy, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Wow. Well, we'll go by that verse by verse, that section there, but uh, first let me just get your overview of that, what you think. Okay, I'm just going to go back to it for a second. I mean, I'm not, uh, it's not something I'm overly familiar with um, and some explanation of this 72 return. Uh, I, that would be interesting to hear what you have to say about that. But I think this is uh, basically saying, uh, when it says, uh, so you hold, uh, I said unto them, behold, I, I, uh, Satan, as lightning falls from the heaven. I'm not sure if this is actually... Uh, referring to the right at the beginning of creation when he was in the tree because um, you know, we'd, we'd be looking at this from a heavenly point of view rather than from an earthly point of view where I believe that you know there is not going to be the concept of time as we understand it now um, so it's possible that's just one possibility it could be I mean I don't know for sure um, and he then says that behold each of these 72 uh, behold, I'm going to give you the power to tread on the serpent and the scorpions and all the power of the enemy. Because scorpions and serpents, uh, we remember that back in the game, we have to go back to Genesis where, you know, after the uh, snake and the tree deceived, or the creature and the tree deceived uh, Eve, Satan said, uh, God, God said, un said unto him, you, from now on you'll crawl on the ground of the belly like a snake and made them into a snake. And I think this is weird. God's uh, sort of indicating there that the serpent is the devil and scorpions are possibly his minions and he's going to give us or give these people all the power over them um, and, um, and, and then nothing he can do will cause them any harm. Um, I mean, I'm not, it's not one of my top subjects, I've got to be honest with you, it's not something I'm over familiar with, but I'll be uh, happy to listen to what you have to say on this, Brother Luke. Okay. Um, all right, let me find it again here. I was searching for another, like a, a, a parallel verse there. Luke, um, oops, 418, let's go to KJV. The computer seems to have a mind of its own, uh, uh, jumping around. Uh, I'm not really controlling it the way it's, I'm supposed to here. Let me see. Read it for you. I've got it here. Uh, now I, I'm going to find it again here. I need to make this work because I need to read it all in. Uh, again, let me see. It's Luke. No. Okay, here it is. Luke 10:18. Uh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, the, the and the seventy uh, returned again with joy. The 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 seventy. So Jesus sent off seventy disciples on a ministry mission, and when they came back, they were all joyful saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Well, I think it's first of all, we need to understand that, uh, and I've, I've done a lot of messages on this, or at least several, where I'm talking about the name of Jesus. Uh, the, the scriptures actually say that we're saved by believing in his name. Now, we know that his name, uh, Jesus, is English translation, uh, and it's it it means literally God saves. So if if we believe in the name of Jesus, we're believing in the fact that God will save us. In other words, if I think that God saves me, it means that God did it. I didn't do it. And if he if he saves me, it means I was in trouble, and he saved or rescued me. So there's a lot just in the name Jesus by believing in his name. And so here they're making the point that there's, 
Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So these disciples, there are 70 of them, so we know it's not just the 12 apostles. 70 of his disciples go off on a mission, and they're just amazed that they have power even over the devils by pre preaching in the name of Jesus. And then, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, in verse 18, he says, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. It seems like that verse is kind of out of context. I don't know why he would say it at that point. Uh, but uh, this verse here, I'm not sure, as you alluded to, whether this, what point in time this really is. Because I have... Uh, I've been confused studying this fall of Satan past or and there's this something happening with Satan in the future. Uh, but I think the main thing that Jesus wants to everybody to know here is that uh, just like he said that he, he was there with, with Abraham, uh, he's telling everybody that he is eternal. He's not just a man that was born 30, 30 years ago. He was there with Abraham. Uh, he, was, he witnessed Satan falling uh, uh, as, as lightning fall from heaven. I think he's using these, these things to another way of proclaiming his deity. Uh, because none of, these, none of these disciples saw Satan fall yeah. from heaven. Uh, if Jesus was just a mortal man that has lived 30 years, how could he have possibly have witnessed this Satan falling like lightning from heaven? Mm -hmm. So true. to me, that's the most important thing from this verse. But the, as far as, behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means hurt you. Um, that gets us to the question of the gifts of the Spirit and, and, and the year two, 2015. <laughs> uh, are we expected to have these same kinds of abilities that these disciples had, that Peter had, and Paul had? They actually raised people from the dead and did mm -hmm. all these miraculous things uh, as signs. Yeah. Are, are all these signs and wonders, are they still things for us today? Or were they, did they apply at that particular time so that uh, they could kind of kickstart this Christianity, this church? Uh, because uh, the Jews required a sign. And uh, they told Jesus, even after he performed all, their, all these miracles, he said, well, we, we want you to give us a sign. <laughs> <laughs> already, he's already raised people from the dead and, and, and healed the blind and fed all thousands of people, and, and they demand a sign. He said, I'm not giving you any sign except the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale yeah. for three, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. That would be the sign that, that would be seal the deal. So I'm going to give you the ultimate sign. I'm going to be killed, die for your everybody's sins, and then I will raise myself from the dead, and that will be the ultimate sign to tell you who I am and that you should believe in me. Uh, so... Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Just, just a, a quick point. I mean, I find it very interesting. I don't know exactly where it is in the Bible. I've been trying to find it. You might know better luck than me. But didn't Jesus actually say when his disciples were talking to him about who was the greatest? I believe it's in that sort of section. And he turns around and said that, um, that greater things will be done for those who have not seen and heard the things that you have. So does that not indicate to you that we should be doing these things and maybe more? Yeah, if that's nowadays, then what it was in them days. Yeah, well, you know, Jesus was alive when he said that. And then we know that he died, buried for three days, raised from the dead, uh, walked among them for 40 days, and then ascended into heaven. And then, uh, the, then soon after that, Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit came, and the church began uh, of indwelled, Holy, Holy Spirit-filled, sealed, Christians, and and then we and we had the apostles, 
And then Paul says that certain things are going to cease. And he said tongues will cease and some prophecies will, will fail and, and so on. And so there, there, there is a division in the church today where some people think that all the things that the apostles were doing and that Jesus did, all these miraculous things, we should still be doing them today. I don't, I don't happen to belong in that camp. I, I know that God can do, provide miracles and he can work miracles through you or me anytime he wants. But I, don't, I think we're a different kind of a, a, a Christian than the beginning of the church. God, I think God gave the apostles a lot more power for miraculous works than he gave you and me. And I've yet to see anybody today, uh, any of these televangelists or anybody, actually doing the kind of miraculous things that, I, that they would convince me that uh, these things still exist today. You you don't, don't, yeah, yeah, you don't misunderstand me. That's not what I'm saying. I appreciate there's people out there that are, uh, should I say, that are uh, not doing it because of God, and I'm particularly sort of thinking, like you said, some of these tele evangelists, we don't get many of them over here in the UK. Um, but I, I, I think Jesus said this uh, to his disciples, and uh, uh, yes, it may be a different way of doing things, we might not need perhaps the, the way you have described it, but I think you know, our witness and our testimony today is so powerful. Uh, I think this is, you know, and I've done this at meetings where I've spoken to a group of non-fellow believers um, and spoken to uh, like hundreds and through my testimony and, and I've just seen the power of God work through my words, you know, and God is, God's spirit is amazing um, and, it, and they didn't have that in the early church as such until, like you said, the day of Pentecost came uh, and, and, you know, it's just, I think this is what it's referring to because the, we, we use the gifts of the Holy Ghost, if I can put it out, the Holy Spirit, to carry out God's work today, you know, in today's world. We don't necessarily go out and resurrect people. I believe it's possible to do that because God's, you know, uh, whether God would do that now is another issue, but I think, you know, it's what, it doesn't all not say that if you believe it in your heart, it shall be done. So as long as you believe it, it shall be done. Mm -hmm. There, there are some verses that are troubling to me. That uh, that uh, he says, if you have enough faith, you can tell the mountain to go from here over to there, be going to the sea, and, and yet I've never seen anybody do that. Does that mean that nobody who's ever existed has had? I don't a think. Sorry, I don't think it's talking about literal mountain. Yeah, I don't think that means. I think God is using that as a obstacles that are in your life that you stop you from coming to Christ that are like mountains. You know, now I had this in the past, yeah, um, where things are that seem insurmountable to you that you can't move for for lack of trying. You might, you know, uh, it could be anything. You know, it's just use pornographic <laughs> pornography as one, yeah. Um, you know, you could have such a big problem with it, you can't move it, it's like a huge mountain, and I think it's a, more of a metaphor that Jesus is using, and he's saying that he can move that out of the way, he can he can throw that into the sea through his Holy Spirit, it's not a lit, I don't believe, I don't know if you've ever viewed it like, it's only my view, whether you've ever viewed it like that, whether no. you've got to, I, I think you're correct, uh, and, and that, that's a perfect example of, a, of I think, a, a metaphor, um, uh, so really, that example could easily be explained as metaphorical. But there's a, there's other verses where he said, "Anything you ask in my name will give it to you." Well, I've I've asked for things in his name that I didn't get. I mean, has every prayer you've ever prayed been given to you? Uh, I don't know of anybody who can say that. And, no. You know, some people will. Some people would argue with me and say. Well, Brother Luke, you don't have enough faith. Otherwise, if you had enough faith, anything you ask for would be given to you. Or, Brother Luke, there's some kind of sin in your life. You need to examine your life and get rid of some sin because that sin is causing you to get a no answer instead of a yes answer to the prayer. Uh, I, I believe God answers every one of my prayers. But sometimes he, he says no. His answer is no. Or sometimes his answer is wait. 
This is not yeah. the right time. I know better than you. Slow down. You, I want to give you what you want, but this is not the right time. And then sometimes you pray and you get an immediate answer. I've I've had miraculous things happen. Uh, uh, I have a video called uh, Signs and Wonders where I describe in detail uh, a, a handful of miracles. I, I, I believe that there are definitely answers to prayers and miracles. So maybe you can watch that or anybody who's viewing this now, watch my video Signs and Wonders. But I do think we're in a different scenario now than the, the age of the apostles. Oh yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, I, I think the abilities of the apostles were kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, diluting down and down and down. Uh, we, we see at the end of Paul's life that why couldn't he heal Timothy? Mm. Timothy had this sickness in his stomach, and you know Paul raised someone from the dead. Paul Paul did miraculous things. Why didn't he just cause Timothy to be healed instead of telling him to drink some wine for his stomach? You know, so um, uh, well we can we can move on, but I, I think that the uh, uh, my conclusion about this uh, these things that these uh, these original disciples and apostles were doing were amazing, but I think that was part of the 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 way God uh, wanted to kick start everything. Look look at how the church grew so quickly in the beginning. Um, uh, under even under great persecution, and it was because of originally because of all these great signs and wonders and the resurrection of Jesus being the ultimate, and that caused everybody to be so inspired that they would uh, spread these seeds of the gospel, uh, like the parable of the sower. They're out spreading the seeds, and they're going all over the world, even at the cost of their lives. All the apostles were martyred except for. Uh, 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 Judas was not a martyr, and John was martyred in a way where he suffered and is in prison, but he wasn't killed. But they they all were so convinced that Jesus was was God and his Savior because of this resurrection and these other signs that they were willing to, even at the cost of their life, preach the gospel. Um, so I believe that these signs and wonders were really important in the beginning to make people get it going. And then, now we're in the age where Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, okay, you've seen me, you've touched my wounds, now you believe, okay? That's what it took for you. You had to see me and touch me. But there, there comes a time where people are not going to be able to see me and touch me, and yet they will still believe in me. Those people are blessed. I really respect those people because they had faith even though they didn't see me and touch me. And that's the age we're in now where we have to just have faith in the scriptures, the truth of the scriptures, and the reality. I've never touched Jesus or seen him, but I believe in my whole heart it's all true. Okay, brother, shall we go on to the next verse? Okay. I know you have a limited time today, so just uh, let me know if you run out of time. Uh, let's go to... Uh, um, okay, let's look at Luke uh, thirteen sixteen. Uh, it says, "And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound?" Lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Um, okay, so I'm going to look at that in uh, context thirteen sixteen. Yeah, yeah. It's when he's teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, isn't it? And yeah. Behold, a woman who had spirit of infirmity eighteen years. And was bowed toward him and could in no way lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thy infirmity. And he laid her hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. 
and the rulers of the synagogue answered with indignity because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people there are six days in which man ought to work and in them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day and Lord answered them and said thou hypocrites does doth not each or each one of you on the Sabbath do loose his ox or his ass from the stall stall and lead him away to the watering um, and ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham who Satan hath bound with low these eighteen years be loosened from her bonds on the Sabbath day and when he had said these things all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for the glory of the things which had been done and yeah sorry we got, uh, brother Bill just joined us can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Bless you, brother. I'm glad you could join us, brother. Uh, we've been talking yeah. about verses that have Satan or the devil in the verse. How are you doing all today? Right. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. I've just noticed that you're saying that the clocks are going forward in America. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. we moved our, that last uh, weekend, we had to set our clocks forward. Oh, because ours don't go forward for, for a while yet. Yeah, right now it's 2.15 here. What time is it in England? Well, it's, it's only just gone 9 now, so I got back from church about 15, 20 minutes ago. Yeah, so we got a 7-hour difference instead of an 8-hour difference, huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, have you uh, listened at all, or you just click on and join us right, right away? Literally, I just, just noticed <laughs> it was on, so I got back from church, left a comment, and come and joined in. Okay. You muted, Luke. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, let's. Uh, we're going We're just talking about verses that contain the word Satan or the devil, and so we're going all over the place as far as uh, you know the subject matter. It's been real interesting. Uh, but I'm having some technical computer problems right now. I'm trying to get back to my, where well, I'm using Bible Hub uh, and just just putting in the word, uh, putting in the word uh, Satan. We're on um, Luke, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Mm -hmm. I've got Luke, Luke 13, 10, yeah. Yeah, it's all of it, Bill, round down to 17. Okay. Jeez. <coughs> I've got, I'm on a document file here that I never wanted to go to. It was not my intention at all. Okay, let me try to get back to Bible Hub here. Do you want me to make some comment while you do that? Uh, the, yeah, please, uh, please go ahead. Re yeah. You can read that and comment on it between the two of you until I get my Bible Hub yeah. back here. Well, I think this is a very interesting um, thing that Jesus is talking about here, and he's talking here about uh, this lady who's in his uh, uh, happens to be in the synagogue where he's preaching, and she's got this infirmity that she's had eighteen for eighteen long years, and she couldn't lift herself up. And Jesus saw her, and he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, lose thy infirmity. Now she must have, I mean, in fringe from that, she must have answered his call and got forwards to meet him. So there was some commitment from her that she wanted, she knew who he was, um, and that she knew that Jesus was about to heal him. Again, it goes back to our previous point of these miracles that Jesus did um, in the early days of the church when he was in his ministry to boost up the church and for later on. Um, now the rulers of the synagogue got indignant about this because it was a Sabbath day and, and they said oh you shouldn't be doing any they took the law literally because I think it says on, on the seventh day that I shall rest yeah and I believe that's what it says in Genesis it says God rested from his work on the seventh day and made it special and holy and the, the rulers of the synagogue made this this sort of challenge to Jesus now I think that was probably sort of implanted into them and I think this is why we get a mention of the devil later on um, you know by the devil you know you know not saying that they are followers of the devil or any way connected with the devil but it just shows you that I believe it as 
Christians and as uh, believers that sometimes we can get tempted and we will get tempted by the devil to do things and we have to be we have to think about this and they didn't like this because they thought that Jesus was breaking the law as they saw it um, and then Jesus answered them quite clearly and says well you know if on the Sabbath don't you go out and tend to your ox or your ass do you not take him away to lead him is that not is that not working on the Sabbath day do you not cook a meal on the, on the Sabbath day do you not go for a walk you know and I believe also Jesus said in one of the other verses that Sabbath was made for man I mean you know and I think this is what he's alluding there to and 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 you know he's saying you know she'd been bound for 18 years this thing why should, why why should the Sabbath day stop her being set free from this and they was ashamed when they heard what he said and, and then there was glory to God I mean that's just my take on it I don't know if Bill's got any more he'd like to say to that well, yeah, yeah. I suppose I would just add that that initially, you know, the commandments and the Sabbath, etc., were, were for for God, you know, the benefit for men. That God created these things for our benefit. I.e., thou shalt not murder. Obviously, that's for our benefit. Resting on the Sabbath because we have an internal biological clock that needs to to rest. And and what 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 these the, the, the Jews have done. The Pharisees and the Sadducees amongst themselves is put the law above above men in that sense. I they didn't care about how people were and how they felt as long as the law was adhered to. When they've got it all back the front, the law was for our benefit, but now they're using the law, you know, not for our benefit. That the law was, you know, became rigid. You know, they even, we know that they even went to extremities and that you know they added. Bets to the law and all sorts of you know, it's amazing what the, what the Pharisees done and, and and as Jesus pointed out and you pointed out earlier, in other verses that you know it's clear that that, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got it all back the front, you know, even even to, you know regarding the temple tax and the and the selling it, you know, in the temple. You know, they, they they created new laws, rules, and regulations so they could make money by selling pigeons and, and all sacrificial animals. You know, thinking they was doing God a favour by raising money, they could make the temple look nicer. But that was the, that wasn't the point. The temple was there at that time as a house of prayer, so it's for our benefit again, so we could communicate with God. So mm -hmm. they, they just got it all back the front, and they 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 legislated. And bound people up so much it was destroying people, and people were becoming ill, and, and, and yeah, absolute madness. Okay, um, everything you guys are saying uh, is certainly correct regarding the scenario. Uh, Jesus is being um, accused. Uh, their their law requires that everybody rest on the Sabbath, but he's out there performing miracles on the Sabbath. And they they want to uh, accuse him for that, and so he's defending himself. And that's one thing. That's one issue in this particular section of verses. the The study is specifically about Satan. So let's see what in this section here we can learn about Satan. Though we've talked about Satan already, uh, the first hour, Bill, before you got here, we we keep on going back to all this mischief that Satan is doing. You know, and and it, uh, he's he. Uh, we started off by talking about how he was trying to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, and he and then he, what he did with the the fall of all the angels, and, and and then what he did with the fall of man, and and then what he's doing within the church, stirring up trouble within the church, planting tares in the field, you know, and and uh, the all these false religions that he's trying to get going. So this is what we've been finding out that. Satan's up to all this mischief, and that, now here in this verse, is, it also says that uh, Jesus is, is bringing up the point that uh, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan had bound 18 long years, be yeah. freed from this bondage on the Sabbath. So, of course, the real issue here, Jesus is defending himself and saying, don't you think I, it's okay to heal someone even though it's the Sabbath? Okay, 
we, you guys discussed that. Now I want to ask you about this. Whom Satan had bound 18 long years. Is Jesus telling us here that Satan actually was the cause of this woman's infirmity? Yeah, I would say, from reading what I can see here, this is what Jesus is saying. Um, it sounds to me like we're not sure the reason, okay, because it doesn't say that, so we can only speculate on that, so I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, but it sounds to me, well, when you read verses 16, um, that, that, that seems to be what Jesus is exactly saying, that, you know, Satan is responsible for this particular illness that she's got, and he wants to set her free because he has more power and glory and and, and and wants to, I don't know, it's only my interpretation, a demonstration that he is, can overcome the works of Satan, uh, and this is a way of showing that in front of many witnesses. Um, and I think, you know, I would say, just looking at it, it's definitely what he's saying here, that for whatever reason, um, it, we can only speculate as to that, but it looks to me as if that's what Jesus is saying here, that, Satan has been allowed to bound this woman in this illness and he wants to set her free. Okay, Brother Bill, do you have an, an opinion on that? It, it seems like Jesus is saying that the reason the woman has been sick for 18 years is because of Satan's work. Well, yeah, yeah, Satan, obviously, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but also amongst this scenario and probably others in the Bible that that sometimes God allows these things so that you know he could be glorified when when he deals with it. You know so you know as it indicates as Stephen was you know indicating in this verse it seems that that you know it says it in verse sixteen and not this woman being a daughter of Abraham Satan that bound lo these eighteen years be loose from you know, this bond on the Sabbath day. So Satan was allowed to reign for 18 years within her. And obviously, the, the, the Jews, obviously, their heart wasn't really prepared to pray for this poor woman. You know, they, they were so legalistic about it, they didn't even want to, you know, pray for her on the Sabbath and get, get her healed. But I think, you know, God allows his things so that when Christ turns up, he can manifest you know, in his power, bring instant healing to her, and by doing so, proven that he is way and above Satan, and the works of Satan. So, you know, th th and that's a hard, a hard saying, and a hard thing, in that, that, that sense, but, you know, for God's glory, and, and for, for the sake of, the real greater good in this scenario, that, that, that people were, you know, come for Christ, and know he is far superior, he is the great I am, and that, that, that they can be saved from, you know, because the signs and wonders were for the Jews, as you, you said earlier, and this should have been, <laughs> the Jews should have twigged onto this, they should have seen that, that he was performing this, this mighty, you know, wonder, bringing healing, and they should have, you know, accepted him as their Messiah, but again, the hardness of the heart was manifested in the fact that they didn't really want to you know, do any, you know, healing on a, on, on the Sabbath day, and they certainly didn't want Jesus doing that. You mm -hmm. know, so it shows that heart situation. 